so you basically described yourself as like a multi hyphenate content creator. Um, but my initial thought was like, when you're like this little kid running around, where you like, I want to be a multi hyphenate content creator. Like, what was your what was your dream job? Like, I, I know everybody has that part. Elementary school, you have to like write. What do you want to be when you grow up? So, what what, what did James want to be when he grew up? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, well, we didn't. Have, I didn't have language, you know, at the time in terms of a multi hyphenate, you know, content creator. I knew I I wanted to create. I was always an artist. I was always writing, uh, performing, uh, making, you know, stuff. Um, but um, you know, it really shifted and it changed. I honestly cannot remember what I wanted to be as a kid. But as I got into uh, sports, I thought I wanted to be a professional athlete. Uh, but I later realized that was simply because of the influences that were around me and because I, I had not been exposed to, you know, filmmakers and thespians and, and artists and things of, of that sort. And um, I only saw those things on television and that didn't seem like a reality that uh, was for me. And so for some time, I wanted to be an Olympian when I was running track. When I was playing basketball, I thought maybe I would go to the NBA because I was so tall. Um, but uh, I, I can't remember in high school wanting to work uh, with artists. Um, so it kind of transformed at one point. I thought I wanted to be an A&R and work in the, the music industry. But once I got to college and I got the opportunity to work on some film sets, I quickly realized that, oh, this is it. I want to be a filmmaker. Got it. Uh, touching on something you just said, I, I think it's very important. Um, and I'm actually doing an episode about this at some point. Um, just the importance of like arts education for like black children and black youth. Like I grew up in performing arts, so that's how I kind of led them, led me down my path. I think my in first grade you had to write a paper, well not a paper obviously, but we had to write a paragraph about what do you want to be when you grow up. And the yeah. only time I, I wanted to do something other than entertainment was in first grade when I said I wanted to be an ice cream man. <laughs> um, but to that point, I've always wanted to do something creative and I always have the thought in my back of my mind like if I had not had that foundation well I don't know what I what I would do because I that's it literally shaped my mind he said that exposure to seeing things beyond the traditional things people tell black youth that can be um so I thought that was like that's very important I'm happy you said that um so switching gears so you like you said you went off to college um you're a uh, alumnus of Florida a &M University um I have love, hate with 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 family. As a, I'm I'm a, I'm a Howard University graduate, and but most of my family. It don't gotta be no hate, bro. It could be all no, love. It's you love. Know. It's, it's I, well, I should say it's I get love. hate from my family because I don't have family went to FAMU, and they like so we have like every every cookout, every family function. It's everybody, like the same. Everybody can't be rightless, so <laughs> <laughs> you know you had you you did what you needed to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I definitely have I definitely have left like the HBCU culture. Um sure. and another one of you guys' is, um notable alumni is um Will Packer. Mm -hmm. And obviously I, I heard an interview from him one time and he spoke about kind of his transition post grad mm -hmm. where he had the thought of like I could go to LA or I could go I could go to LA to start this whole filmmaking thing because obviously Tallahassee isn't like a, a quote unquote film city or a city for to go beyond as far as entertainment. But then he had the second thought was like, okay, maybe I could do Atlanta because Atlanta is uh, in between. It's not quite LA, but I could still kind of find my foot in there. So, what was your post grad strategy after like leaving family? You have all this knowledge as a young adult. Now you're like, I'm ready to go do this thing. So, what was your uh, thought process? Yeah, I made the decision to move to LA. And it's interesting because a lot of folks were encouraging me to uh, check out Atlanta. But, um, for me, Atlanta uh, felt like FAMU North. <laughs> you know, so many FAMU graduates moving to Atlanta. And at that particular time in my life, I really wanted to kind of be set free to find myself. And I felt like LA was the place to do that. In addition, I knew that LA was the Mecca uh, as it pertained to entertainment, you know, film and television. And uh, although I knew I would be a very small fish in a big pond, I thought eventually I want to get to L.A. L.A. will be the goal. So let me just go and start to, you know, uh, plant roots, you know, in the city. And uh, so I had met Will Packer when I was, I think, a junior at FAMU. Uh, I continued to stay in touch with him. We did some work together my senior year. 
I was student body vice president and he was promoting this Christmas um, throughout our homecoming festivities. And I was over homecoming as the, the, the VP of SGA. So I got a chance to kind of collaborate with Will in that way. And uh, when I moved to LA, I reached out to him for an internship and he actually gave me my first uh, internship. At the time, he was working on a film called Takers. And so I was Will Packer's intern. Um, but I like how you just like throwing out these like great black films. Like, you know, he had yeah. this movie this Christmas, this yeah. movie Takers. <laughs> yeah, man. But the thing was, I didn't have I didn't have a job. I didn't have a car. I didn't really know anybody in L.A. I had never been to L.A. when I made the decision to move. Uh, I graduated and I was like, look, I'm going to jump and just build my wings on the way down. And I'm going to just trust that God is going to provide and it's going to be OK. But uh, I brought a one way flight. I found an apartment to sublet, moved to L.A. First thing I did was I got on the bus. And I went to the Beverly Center and I started applying for jobs. And I had this, this a bachelor's in business administration, but I was like, look, I'll just get a job in retail, you know, the quickest job I can find so I can have some income coming in. And I was, you know, reaching out to Will. I was reaching out to other folks that I knew in LA. And I was, I was, I was in the city for two weeks and I finally got a call from Will's assistant. Her name was Brandy at the time. And she said, hey, you know, we've gotten your emails, you know, and we're about to start a new project. Uh, but it's going to be shot in L.A. We would love to offer you an internship, but it's going to require you to come out here. Do you think you can get to L.A.? I was like, I'm already here. I was like, <laughs> just tell me what day you want me to be at the studio <laughs> and I'll be there. And so it was literally the perfect setup because uh, I was already staying really close to Culver City. And that's where Sony Pictures, you know, was. That's where they were shooting the film. And so I had to like walk like two blocks, catch a bus. And it was a straight shot of, uh, of Venice to get to the studio. And that's what I did for my first six months. And that was literally my kind of my launching pad for uh, getting a start, you know, in LA and in the entertainment industry. That's dope. Um, one of the things you said that, I, that actually is my next question that I want to kind of piggyback off of is the fact that you got your opportunity from another, a fellow graduate of your, of your school, uh, using that alumni connection, that network. Um, and I'm sure you've seen the movie like film, the film um, School Days by Spike Lee, like most people had. Um, and obviously, like he always talks about it being like a microcosm for like the black community. Um, although it has like a lot of the negative connotations with it, also, I think one thing we can say, at least about HBCU culture and just like black community at large, we do have, we know how to find our tribe, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. and lean on each other to kind of like elevate. Mm -hmm. um, so, to my next question, there's always this argument that is the oddest argument in the world, people love to make it, that HBCUs aren't like, don't prepare for the real world because, you know, they're not diverse. Because apparently there are no black people in the real world, apparently. <laughs> they're only awesome. other people. <laughs> um, but can you kind of talk about like how, why, why, one, why that isn't true for you, and then two, how you feel like going to an HBCU actually has helped you along the way? Yeah, you know, I've heard that argument. I think it's dumb. <laughs> That's people's favorite Twitter argument. <laughs> yeah, I think it's dumb because most of us are, uh, we assimilate into white culture and into whiteness and whiteness has always been centered for our entire lives. And so this idea that we can't, the, the idea that because we make the decision to go to a historically black college university that, that we're gonna lose the, the ability to uh, interact with other cultures, I think is um, dumb. Um, and on the flip side of that, uh, the great thing about going to a historically black college, and, and me specifically FAMU, is I, I learned things about myself that I would not have learned at any other place, that a, a PWI would not have instilled in me this confidence and this ability where when we left FAMU, we left feeling like we could compete against the best the world had to offer. And so um, there's, um, there's a, like a coming of age, there's a, a learning of your, yourself and your history that prepares you, in my opinion, more than a PWI where you come out and you know that, um, you know that you are black excellence. And there's nothing like black excellence. And in my opinion, black excellence trumps, um, it, it just, it, it just, it, it trumps or supersedes um, 
you know, any type of uh, uh, negative idea and um, the cream rises to the top. So, yeah. No, definitely. I always have a conversation with one of my friends who went to Clark Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. I'm from Atlanta. So, um, like, I grew up in a black city. Like, I'll, I'll, people always have the question, like, on social media, when did you have your first black teacher? I'm like, I've had black teachers in my entire life. But mm -hmm. even still going to HBC, like you said, there's like this, I can't, you can't even, like, an awakening you have in your brain. Like, it, it, it fosters this community and this experience to bridge you into this Black excellence. You, and also, like, the full dimension of Black people yeah. outside. Because whether you grew up with Black people in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, abroad, or anywhere else, there is this diversity that, that exists within diaspora that you normally get to see in its full spectrum outside of, like, an HBCU campus at one time. So, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um... So to prepare for this interview, I kind of went back through Giants and like watched and really like kind of just like immersed myself in it. Um, and just most recently, literally right before we started talking, I had, I had to go ask this question in because I'm watching this. I'm like, oh, this is this this is very good. So on the 30th birthday episode, Dirty 30 on, of season two, Malachi is having like this breakdown about his life, essentially. Um, and he's kind of like... He's like hallucinating like the um the um like the podcast lady. Like I can't think yeah. her name right now. Uh, like he's talk he's talking to her, like he's having these like this these this this inner conversation. Right. He talks about kind of like losing faith in what he's meant to do. Like everything is like I've done all these things, I've like he's spiraling essentially. Mm -hmm. How has that have you ever had that Malachi moment in your journey to this moment? Like what, what how has that been for you? Have you ever had that second guess like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Let me just pack my stuff. And all the time, bro. Like uh, in terms of that doubt and that that second guessing, um, like sometimes I say, particularly being uh, an artist in LA, and the journey it takes to get to kind of a place of success or just a place of stability. That sometimes you do it so long that you begin to wonder if it's even for you. You're like, did I even hear? Like I thought this was a call on my life. I thought. I heard God when he said that, you know, that he had this for me, but um, I've been in that place, man, uh, quite a few times where I was just questioning, uh, is this going to happen? Is this going to work out? Um, and then even as of late, I deal with a lot of performance anxiety that even once you get to a place and it's like, okay, I'm here, it's right there. Then sometimes you start to question okay, now can I perform at this particular level? And so um, many things in Giants uh, for me uh, was cathartic. It was uh, a lot of me pouring my personal experience, you know, on the page. And that scene in that episode is one that people, uh, that people really uh, relate to in a way that I think is transformative. And I think it's like a mirror where um, a lot of folks watch episode five and they're like, ooh, damn. I see myself or, ooh, that was a trigger. <laughs> no, definitely. And I, and I think, too, with you with you playing Kim, does it, does it bring a different level of it in that, in that sense? Does it feel different? Because one thing to write it as a writer, you're like, I'm going to write this, somebody else is going to do it. Now it's like, I wrote this, now I have to go actually step yeah. into this character, step into this moment. So what was that like for you? Yeah, well, the great thing is, like, episode 205 was written by J. August Richards. And so although I was a showrunner, you know, creator, um, and had my hand in shaping the story and where we were going to go. It was a really cool experience to be able to pass the responsibility of writing the script off to another writer. And I remember even when I got the script and I sat down and read it, like I was shook. Like I had to call Jay and be like, man, I think you just wrote my favorite episode of this entire series. And so um, for me, it was, it, was, it was cool because I could then... Um, not necessarily worry as much about the script side, and I could really kind of focus on Malachi, which was a goal of mine with season two. Is why I did, I did not direct, you know, the second season. It's why I, I created a writer's room because I wanted the opportunity to be in Malachi's head a little bit more and not have to worry about setting up a shot or not being, um, you know, not having that pressure, you know, on my shoulders to, to get a script done. Uh, so that was a part of my objective is to get inside of Malachi's head um, and to, to try to live that experience with him. But equally, it was great being able to bring James's experience uh, 
and put them into the character of Malachi as well. No, definitely. I think everybody at some point has that, like you said, that moment of doubt, no matter what you do, you're like, dang, what am I, yeah. whether you're 16, whether you 13, yeah. whether you 18, 35, like there's always, I, and I, think, I think too, you have it, it almost like reoccurs, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. like at different facets of your life. You're like, no one's exempt from having that <laughs> Malachi breakdown moment. Um, no. And I want to jump back to what you said, what you said about almost like stepping back. I'll believe this the creator and the showrunner and like see the one you were like really hands on, like almost being like a, a I, don't, I wouldn't say a one man band, but essentially like having your hands in all the um, We deal with a lot of creators and a lot of them are like almost like all They want they want to have they want to create everything. They want it to be their perfect vision. Can you kind of talk about the importance of almost like stepping back and allowing other people to kind of take over those roles and kind of how, how has that affected your storytelling and production? Well, you know, uh, filmmaking is a creative sport. Um, and I, I like that. I've never heard anybody say that. I like that. It's a creative, a creative sport. It's a creative sport. And I want to be, I want to be as collaborative as, as possible. But season one, I wore all of those hats because it was a brand new show. Nobody knew what this thing was or what it was going to be and so it was a a bit more challenging and difficult to get people to give their time um if you weren't like a person or a close friend to ask you to come and spend 12 hours (laughs) for uh multiple days to to shoot an episode is a lot you know to ask of a person um but it, it becomes a lot easier once there's a product out in the world and people can look at it they can see that it's quality that it uh has something to say um, that is portraying, you know, people of color, um, and in particular black people in a, in a, in a positive way, but also in a way that is very honest and real and, and, and raw. And so with season two, I was able to take off some of those hats because people wanted to be a part of this thing that I had built. Um, and it's a lot easier to get people to jump on a moving train. You know what I mean? And so, uh, but ultimately that's what I wanted. But season one, I had to, I had to build it first. It's like, you know, that old saying, if you build it, they build will come. It, they'll come. Build it, they will come. But you got to build it first. And sometimes in building it, you might be, you might be solo. Um, or it, there may be few. But there's this other saying that I would, I would take a few good men any day over, you know, um, over to 300 is like the story of Gideon. I don't know if you know that story, that Bible story about Gideon. He thought he needed uh, all of these, these men to win this army and God was like, send them home um, because uh, all you need are, are those who are focused and who are diligent. And that's what I had with, you know, with both season one and season two. But um, I welcome as much help, you know, as I can possibly get because it's only going to make the project better. That's true. I think a lot of times people are so caught up in like, it has to be this vision, this is what I see, that you, like you said, there's art in collaboration. I think some of the best art happens to collaboration. You get to really see, because as people, as, as any people, we have our own set of experience, our own viewpoint, but sometimes you don't flip it and see the opposite side of it. And I think that's what creates the nuance in storytelling that really creates some of the best television, the best stories that we like have grown to love. Yeah. Um, so as black as a black creator, a black storyteller, there is always this pressure, I guess you can say, from our community. We are some of our, our own type of critics sometimes that like black stories have to be almost the 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 narrative for every single black person on the planet. It has to be mm-hmm. all encompassing of all of our experiences and it can't mess up mm-hmm. at all. So how do you kind of navigate that as far as when you be creating stories? Like how do you, do you even take that pressure on you? Like, no way. I can't take that pressure on. You just like yeah. I'm still right what I know. You can't. We're not a monolith. You know, we uh, there's no there's, there's not one way to be black, and uh, I just try to say fuck it. You know, um, and I try not to think about it, and I also I try to create for myself. Where, um, granted, you know, uh, this is a business, and you do have to consider your audience, but um, you can't really go into the creative process thinking about the critics, <laughs> you know, just get the work done, get it out and let it be what it's going to be. But if you're already thinking about the critics in the creative uh, process, you're going to, you're going to stunt yourself. Um, you're going to stifle that creativity. And so I, I try not to think about it and I just really create from my heart and I create the things that I would want to see. That's dope. That's dope. And I think with giants, the thing people really connect to is the fact that I'll, it's, 
whether you whether you experience those things or not, you probably know someone who does. It's it's, it's very honest. It's very transparent. Yeah. Um, and I think also as a black storyteller, there's this. I want to know your opinion. As in this time, especially, there is like the need for storytelling is to kind of like reflect what's going on in the world to an extent. But as black creators, what's the balance do you think of reflecting like black trauma on screen and black joy? Like where where does where that come? Because we want to see like obviously there is yeah. truth in like writing those narratives of like what's going on. But also, we don't want to ever just slave for every year for the rest of our life either. Yeah, I think every you know everybody has a role to play, and so if you are that creative who wants to uh, talk about black trauma, I think there's a space for that. There's a quote by Zora Neale Hurston that says, "If we are silent about our pain, they will kill us and say that we enjoyed it." So somebody has to tell that story, but uh, equally, somebody also has to tell the story about our joy and about our uh, victories, and uh, we need comedies. Uh, just like we need drama. It's like we need it when they see us. Like Ava needed to tell that story. And I know- Which is like one of the best, I think it's like one of the best things that's come out in a very, very long time. Up to, man. I wept after every single episode. Um, and so I recognize how important that work is. But then I also want to laugh. I want to watch Insecure. I want to watch things that feel a bit more light. I want to watch things where I can uh, see myself and you know my friends. Um, but you know, it's, it's a balance. It, it kind of goes to, and I'm not one of the, the those, uh, creatives or, uh, even black people who I'm not tired of the slave narrative or, or seeing films about, uh, about our history. Um, and so I just believe that there's a place and I want to get to the, the place where there's space for all of this content, where, uh, that can exist, you know, side by side with, a uh, with a romantic comedy and, a psychological thriller, you know, and a horror film that we literally can tell all aspects of our stories and we should not place any limits or barriers on that. That's one thing I've definitely loved about the past few years. We've seen like an influx of different um, black narratives from Jordan Peele's like with us, Get Out, then you saw like the photograph with um, Lakeith and um, Issa, which is a beautiful film. There's it's been like this new resurgence of variety of, of black faces. Yes. It's like, I, I have so many friends who write in different things, and they're like, I want to write like a black sci-fi movie. I'm like, well, write a black sci-fi movie. Because I mean, you think about do black people exist in the future? Are we ever anywhere else besides? It's called Afrofuturism. I mean, essentially, right. that's a lot of what uh, Black Panther was. You know? Like, let's get into those spaces. Let's not allow anybody to uh, to box us in, including our trauma. Let's not allow anybody to box in our trauma. Like, if we want to tell those stories, let's tell those stories. And there's always going to be somebody that's going to be out there to also tell the story about our joy, you know, as well. So, Definitely. So, at what point did you sit down on your couch, wherever you were, driving down the 405, and you're like, I'm writing Giants. This is my next thing. I need to create this thing. Yeah, for sure, man. I was, I was actually in New York at the time when I decided to do Giants. Um, I was working on another digital series called First. And I was putting a lot of my time, my resources, my uh, creative energy into that project. And I was a director, I was an actor, and I was a producer on that project, but it wasn't my show. Uh, it was written and created by Jamila Biggs, and it was a fantastic you know, show that I really enjoyed and I learned a lot from. But ultimately, it wasn't mine. And so there were still some limitations. There were things that I wanted to do or things that I wanted to see, you know, with that show that I didn't have complete autonomy or I didn't have, I wasn't the decision maker, you know, with that. Um, and so uh, first I got an opportunity where it was moving forward um, and we thought that it was going to uh, get developed for a network. And so I said, okay, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to step away and really focus on stories that I want to tell um, because I had looked up and I realized I had spent like five years just working on other people's projects, um, which was cool because it was a great gym for me. And I always look at creativity uh, similar to a sport. Like you've got to get in the gym, you've got to work out. Um, and all of those projects were a great place for me to kind of really figure out what I wanted to do in my own creative projects. But it was time for me to birth something. Like I knew, all right, I got to put my baby into, you know, out into the world. 
Um, and so I was in New York and I was working as a digital producer on a show called Younger. And I started writing Giants uh, on the train, you know, to work. And I would just type ideas, you know, on my cell phone. And I want to say, I, I remember writing the first script uh, and finishing it around January. I think it was like 2015. And I remember being at Sundance and I showed one of the first drafts of the pilot to my, uh, my good friend, Will Catlett. Um, and I remember being at Sundance and just being really inspired and telling myself, when I get back to LA, I'm going to start production, you know, on this, this series. And I only had one episode written and I also didn't show, I didn't show the script to many people. Um, and even moving forward, I would not show the scripts or the drafts of the scripts to, to anybody in the first season, because I didn't want to get paralyzed by anybody's opinion on what I should do. Um, and I wasn't aiming for perfection. Like I knew, okay, because uh, I do believe that writing is rewriting, that a large part of the writing process is getting notes and uh, being able to go back in and kind of mold the clay. But for me, Giants was a gym. I just wanted to get in the gym and work out. And so I would write the script and we would go straight into production and then I would go and I would write the next script. So it was unconventional in a way and I used to call, I used to refer to Giants as an unconventional series because of the way I was kind of shaping it. But it was the way that I needed to do it because largely Giants was never about uh, winning awards. It was never about becoming a series that could, uh, could, um, um, like break barriers or make it to television or, you know, provide me with the opportunity to be more well-known. It literally started as, hey, I want to write, I want to direct, I want to act. And people are telling me that I can't do all of these things at the same time. And so I'm just going to do it. And maybe not to prove it to other people, but maybe to prove it to myself, because I haven't even given myself the permission to do all of these things at once. And so if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna uh, prove it to myself, I just gotta do it. And Giants was that. And I finished it and we put it into the world and people fucked with it. And we decided to do a second season. You said, can you talk about kind of how you made the decision to not wait in a sense. I feel like we have this conversation with my creative friends a lot of the times where, well, one, you know, you're going to write this thing. You're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it like a network. I want to pitch this thing. I was want, because I think as creators, you have this big vision of everything being a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, talk, can you talk about one, just the decision to say, you know what, I'm going to make this. Like, I'm going to take, I'm going to take ownership into my own hands and the importance of that. And then also the importance of not waiting till all of your shit is together sometimes. Sometimes you got to, there's this quote, I don't know who said it, but sometimes you have to take what you have right now and just go and then do yeah. the rest along the way. You got to jump and build your wings on the way down. Like, um, uh, man, so I'm a big, I'm a big advocate for creatives just making their own content. I know we all sometimes have this, this very grand idea that, we're gonna go and we're gonna pitch our ideas and a network is gonna pick it up and we're gonna have uh, our show on television. Um, but what I've come to learn as a creative is that it is really extremely uh, difficult <laughs> to get a show on air. Uh, and at times it takes years, and I mean years, of development, of waiting, um, and then it still might not come on TV at all. And you could get a development deal. Uh, you could get a pilot greenlit. You could shoot that pilot and it still not make it to television. You know what I mean? And so there comes a point where you really have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this so I can be on television? Am I doing this so I can be well known or so I can be famous or am I doing this because I have something to say, you know, am I doing this because I want to be an actor and this is the way I express myself and this is, uh, and this is the way I utilize the gifts that God has put inside of me. And so for me, there comes a time where 
if you're not acting, then you don't want to be an actor. Or if you're not writing, then you don't want to be a writer. Um, and you cannot wait on Hollywood to, to give you that opportunity. You have to take it. Um, and so um, I'm just, a, uh, I'm, I'm the, the type of creative where I always want to be about the business of creating. And I understand the bureaucracy and I understand the politics and I understand the business of Hollywood because it is a business. And when you're a young creative, um, network isn't just going to take a chance on you and take the chance that you're going to, uh, even if you have a good idea, you still have to get that idea uh, to the page. And then you also have to be able to have the experience and the foresight to craft an entire, an entire serialized um, uh, story. Uh, it's not just about that pilot. It's about can this go the distance? What does this look like across a full season? What does this look like across multiple seasons? Can this idea sustain itself? And um, and a lot of that comes with experience. It comes with uh, ha having worked on other projects and other shows. And so for me, instead of waiting on 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 myself to arrive to that place, you know, years down the road when I have that type of insight and experience, I'm gonna just do it myself and I'm gonna uh, put my work and I'm gonna put my art out there. And uh, so I encourage, you know, all creatives to to do that. No, I love that. Um, you talked about being in the gym or looking at being a creative as being in the gym the same way you, you, if you were an athlete, you gotta go and put your 10,000 hours in on the court. As a creative, sure. you put your same 10,000 hours in. Um, how do you feel? I like also too. I had a conversation yesterday with um, the actress Burgundy Baker from The Shot, and one thing I talked to her about, she was saying like she always felt when she was younger, she was impatient enough, and she didn't realize like the thing she was in such a rush to do is like being like a recurring or a lead on a series. She wasn't ready for it when she really wanted it, and the the time that it took to get her to that space, she needed that time to really develop and learn like no time was lost nothing was lost on her so for you what are those experiences you think back think back to in this moment as you're gaining traction success like dang when i did this one little job i hated it but now i see the importance of that thing oh man when i tell you that's a word and everything that she said is spot on and that has been my experience as well sometimes we think that people aren't giving us opportunities because of whatever reasons but you know sometimes we're just not ready and it's not because you're not talented. It's not because I want to specify that. Like you said, you're not ready. Absolutely. Sometimes you're not ready. And I believe that timing is everything. And sometimes those no's are, uh, are God's way of protecting us. Um, because um, it's largely about sustainability, right? Like I want longevity, you know, in my career. And so I don't necessarily want to just shoot up like a rocket. I want to have that gradual, you know, ascent. Um, because I want to be doing this for years and years and years and years to come. And so in order to do that, it's imperative to develop a really strong foundation. And sometimes the foundation, it looks like there's no elevation, right? Because you're just working on the bottom level, the bottom floor. Right. And I think a lot of creatives or a lot of people who aspire to work in this industry, they want to skip the foundation phase. And then they wonder why they only have 15 15 minutes of success because your foundation was shaky, you know? Um, and so don't be in a rush, you know, don't despise small beginnings because it's those small beginnings. It's, it's uh, those plays that you're doing, those web series that you're doing, those internships, that, that time that you're spending working under someone else, you're laying that foundation. So when you're ready to start really building the structure, you know that you have the fundamentals down and you can actually sustain being able to, um, being able to perform at this high level and you're not gonna waver or it's not gonna come crashing down. And so for me, that looked like I was an intern, you know, for Will, and then I became a production assistant um, and I was a production assistant for a number of years. Then I became an assistant to a creative executive. So I spent three years just kind of working in the studio system at the, the bottom level, grabbing coffee, um, grabbing uh, dry cleaning, making copies, but also working under people and watching and being able to look at budgets, being able to look at schedules, being able to see day out of days and contracts. And for me, largely, that was somewhat of my film school because I didn't have a formal training, 
you know, in film. And then it was jumping into acting classes and it was writing and directing, you know, short films that did not get into Sundance, that did not get into Tribeca, that did not get into any of these really big festivals that I wanted. Um, I wanted that recognition because for me, it was like that validation that would say, okay, you're enough. Um, but it was also uh, the universe saying, can you believe that you're enough without somebody or some film festival uh, giving you a laurel or giving you some award? Can you believe that your work is still valuable? And so I needed that, that time to really sort through those emotions and get to the bottom of, okay, I am enough. Like, you know, I don't, I don't need those things. Or also really being able to find the intention behind my attention. And like, why am I doing this? Like, what is it that's, you know, keeping me going? When I'm going on, I'm going on audition after audition after audition, I'm spending hours and hundreds, you no, know, spending thousands of dollars on these classes and these self-tapes, and I'm not booking, why am I still doing this? And then you start to get to the why of it. And you start to realize, I do this because I love it. I do this because uh, there is no plan B. I do this because I believe that this is what I was put on this earth to do. Um, and then once you get once you get centered in that belief and you uh, start to know that you know that your why and it's unshakable, that's when the universe can then give you uh, the, the, the guest star, the co-star, the series regular, the show that wins an Emmy, you know, because now you are planted in your why. And um, so, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, it was... And even for me, uh, work, I worked at TV Land as a digital producer. You know, I worked on like five other web series, five other shows before I got to Giants. And so all of those things were preparation because I was learning how to market content on the digital space. I was learning storage structure. I was learning how to set up a shop. And so I needed that time before I got to Giants so I could pour all of those things into Giants. And as a result, Giants is a culmination of shit, like nine years of doing a bunch of other stuff um, before I got to that show. Definitely. I was having a conversation with the writer and I was saying like, kind of to your point, like not being patient, um, when you really want to get to that thing. Mm -hmm. But essentially, with it being like, like you said, that culmination, you have something to write if you haven't lived a life. If you, if you woke up tomorrow and your life was the best thing ever, what would you write about really? And for, that people want to actually want to see. Even, um, I think, to just, like, me being a um, production assistant for the first time. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, every job I've had since high school is literally a production assistant. So working at a grocery store where I'm making coffee and doing these different things, working at a country club, working at a restaurant, the bus play, all these little small jobs. I'm like, oh, this is an assistant. Everything I'm going to do, I've done in some capacity. Are you going to drive? I've driven. Okay, I've done all these little things. I'll yeah. make coffees. I just work at a school. I can make copy. It's like all these things you even think about. Right. Like, oh, yeah, these skills were handy at some point in, in my life. I guess this was a moment. Um, or even like you said, like that being your film book, I'll never forget um, working on a show and our producer basically telling us as assistant. She was like, I remember being an assistant. And like, you know, you're an assistant. You get, like, a lot of paperwork comes through. Like you're making copies. You're seeing a lot of stuff. And yeah. she kind of talked about how like when she was an assistant, she was just kind of like, you know, they say make five copies of this. She makes five copies of this but not really like actually sitting and looking at what is this paperwork? What, how is this shaping the production of this? And mm -hmm. even with me, like having the opportunity to- Making a copy for the, yourself. <laughs> no, right? Making a copy for yourself, for your records. <laughs> <laughs> no, but even like working on the production side of it, I think there's, I think people forget there's a whole like, like you said, there's a business to storytelling in film. So working on the production side of something, you see, how things are looking logistics wise because one thing to write and like okay i'm gonna do a car a car chase what does that look like logistically like how does that look monetarily how is that feasible so like you said it's all comes together when it's time to actually put the rubble to the road on your own stuff it all comes together absolutely but i want to get back to giant so the the right. three essential kids three central characters you have malachi journey in a day and yeah. I, like I said, I was just rewatching it, and I, this quote like just stood out to me. This line stood out to me, and it says, "Hold on, I wrote it down." So Quasi says to a day, "I get the impression that you don't allow yourself to see the good in life." And when he said that, I feel like that rang true. That's like a common thread of all three characters. For some reason, 
they have these good things that like there's the actors about themselves they keep getting caught up in like the negatives in their life would you say that's sure yeah so episode four i think 204 um, uh yeah i think so they're like they're like in a park yeah yeah, talking about four, four. This. yeah so vanessa bait and kelly wrote that episode um now that's definitely true man i think because you know largely giants was about these three millennials who were battling their inner giant and they were being put through it, you know? And uh, it's kind of like what you said at the top of this interview about we have our trauma, but we also have our joy. Um, and being able to have the perspective of even when we're in trauma, there's still joy. Um, and it's important, it's imperative that we reshape our minds to be able to look for the good in life. Like wake up every day and, uh, and list five things that you're thankful for, that you're grateful for. Um, because I believe that what we focus on expands. And so there's always, there's always something good, even if it's that you're alive. That's a good thing, you know? So let's start there. Um, but no, I love that line. That's a, that's a really- Yeah, really, I was like, you know, you kind of watch something that's like, wait, that just like rang in my ears. I was like, oh, this, this is like a, yeah. a common theme of the entire show. And even to your point, you said like, it's, it's based upon these like millennials Mm -hmm. And there, I think when you're like in your 20s, you look at, oh, by the time I get to 30, my life's going to be great. But we notice with these characters, they're like right at that cusp and their life still haven't reached even their potential. Like there's a, um, I thought this dynamic was interesting where Journey is leaving the Walgreens after she has like the, she's trying to like <laughs> clean the uh, blood off the pillow. And she runs into her, um, one of her Neos and she's like, oh, you're my, you know, my, she's basically had the conversation about like, uh, the girl says like, um, oh, I, I haven't seen my profile in so long. Mm -hmm. And like being somebody who went to HBC, I, you know, like the, I feel like people look at their profiles as somebody who's like almost like, mm -hmm. not untouchable, but there's like this reverence you have for this person. Sure, yeah. And in that moment, knowing like Journey's backstory, she's in a place where her life is almost falling apart, but this girl still like reveres her in a certain way. Well, you kind of see that in that juxtaposition, it's like a very interesting like dynamic between the two. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. And I thought that was like very interesting that you guys actually decide. Cause obviously people think like, you know, your early twenties, obviously you like to part. By the time you're 30, it should all, even you saw Malachi started his birthday. So he's literally breaking down again. Yeah. It's also largely about being kind to yourself and like get rid of these timelines. Like I know we can't help it. We all have done it. Um, and it started from when we were kids when we were like, Oh, by the time I'm 25, I'm going to be doing this. By the time I'm 30, I'm going to be doing this. And so then you get to 30, and if you haven't achieved those things, you you feel like you're um, like you're not on you're not on track, right? Um, and so the thing that I'm working on in life is, uh, is to get to the place where I can look at the journey as the goal. Like, the journey is the goal. And so as long as the journey is the goal, I'm always on the journey. Like, I'm always on track. I'm always you know, in alignment with, um, with the things that I want, so. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you're not shy about, you talk about this openly, is the fact that you really enjoy putting your friends on and showcasing their talents through your um, series, like whether that's through acting or behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, so can you talk to me about why that's important to you, one? And then also, well, answer that part, and I'll get to the second part. I, I want to Oh, it's I mean, it's important because... Um, all right, we, we do, we spend 12 hours or more, you know, uh, a day when we're in production. So if you're going to spend that much time with people, it might as well be people that you fuck with, you know, and, um, in particular in this city, in LA and in this business, you come up with people and you know, the journey, you know, how, um, how long and, uh, how hard someone has worked you know, towards a thing. And so if I could be, if I could be the one to give them a piece of that dream, then I would love to, I would love to do that, you know, for everybody that I actually have a close relationship with. So that's the reason why I do it. You, I, I like what you just said. It's perfect segue. Give them a piece of that dream. Yeah. So obviously, um, we, although we, you don't create these things for awards and things like that. It's always great to get an award for something you've done. Um, and Giants has gotten many awards, but one thing I, one thing I didn't, first of all, I didn't know this was possible for a digital series to get an Emmy, daytime Emmy nomination or an award one. 
So what was the feeling to know that you not not got one, you got two, and one was for you, but one was for your also your longtime friend Vanessa? Okay, so okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back for a second. I'm gonna say although the the genesis, the catalyst for why I did Giants or why I started it, like uh, was not for awards because I also did not know uh, about a lot of these award shows. Um, I did, I didn't even know that it was possible to win an Emmy for a digital series, but once we knew that uh, once we knew that it was possible, please believe we was coming to collect <laughs> because we knew that our show was award worthy. Uh, we knew the, uh, the sacrifices that were made and the amount of black excellence uh, that was put into the show. And so uh, we went after, you know, those awards. And I believe, you know, all black creatives should like go and collect your things. Right. And so um, we were nominated for uh, two Emmys season one, um, myself as an actor, Vanessa as an actor. But in our second season, we were nominated for 11 Emmys. We were the fifth most nominated show at the daytime Emmys that year. And Vanessa and Terrence Terrell uh, won two Emmys. Um, and so um, in terms of how that felt, it was it was. Man, it was for me the best thing about it was was um, experiencing that with uh, folks that had started as friends and had become family, and um, and I think it also for me kind of represented that um, everything that God had promised me that this show would be and what it would represent that those Emmys were a part of the the physical symbolism of that promise. Um, that we started literally in my kitchen and in my living room in a modest uh, apartment in Koreatown. And uh, it was a symbol of literally where God can take you, that you can start in such a humble place and he can literally take you to the stage of the daytime Emmys, um, and that anything is possible. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it, it, it had so many, so many emotions. It was just a good time, bro. It was a, it was a fucking good time. Yeah. No, definitely. Like even to your point, if when you like pitch shows like these networks, you say like, they go through all the bureaucracy of, of TV and all this, then they kind of almost get. I don't, I don't want to say taint it, but taint it from like what you really probably wanted it to be. All these hands to get in the pot, but to create something like like you say, like grassroots with people you love, and to see it go to that that level, it I can only imagine what that feels like to see like your hard work to be acknowledged in that way. So congratulations, although it's, I'm a few years late, congratulations there. Oh, thank you, bro, I appreciate it, thank you, yeah. Um, another quote, this happens, quite, quite, first of all, quite a lot of good lines. So yeah. the, writers are, the writers are doing it with these lines. I don't know they really likewise, <laughs> we have a lot of the lines. So he yeah. also he says this after the earthquake to a day also, he says the safest place you can be in a crisis with the people, is with the people you love. So who are some of the people that you love? Who, uh, of course my family, um, uh, my Giants uh, family is included because they've become an extended family. Um, I have a, a, a group chat called the Champagne Room. <laughs> and uh, it's my, my two best friends since childhood are in that group chat in addition to some new friends, some here in LA, some in New York. Uh, but I'm really big on friendship. Like I have, I've, I've been blessed to have a, a kind of a large extended uh, set of friends and we do a lot of things together. We travel the world together. Uh, we work together. We play hard together, you know? Um, and so friends and family are the people I love the most. I love it. Um, so what other projects are you working on outside of Giants? What's going on? What's going on with the Giants playing mind? Yeah, so uh, I wrote a feature last year um, that's actually set at an HBCU homecoming. Okay. Um, yeah, First of all, I want, I need, I feel like HBCUs don't have enough content in general. I need like, 50, I need a whole section of HBCU content when you go to like the black section of films. I need like 30 films. Yeah, so uh, I, I wrote that film last year and we're kind of seeing what's going to happen with that. Uh, I've been developing a new show for like two years um, that is... You know, so when I was saying it is sometimes it's hard <laughs> to get a show on television, uh, it's because I'm going through that experience right now, but it's starting, you know, to get a little bit more traction. 
Um, and uh, similar to Giants, it, a lot of it is pulled from our own personal experiences. Uh, right now, the tentative title of this project is called Trade. And so you can uh, imagine or deduct, you know, if you kind of know what trade means, but particularly within the queer community, what the show is probably about. Um, uh, working on some, some new Giants content uh, right now, still in the writing phase. So I know a lot of folks have been asking, when are we getting a season three? I still don't have like a, a date. I don't have any promises right now, but I am creating. I am writing. Uh, I'm co-writing right now with Vanessa. Um, and so it's going to happen. You know, we're definitely going to put more Giants content out. Uh, but we got, we all got kind of busy, you know, Vanessa's super busy right now. She's writing on a bunch of television shows. She's writing some features. Can um, I just also say really quickly, I'm, I was happy to see Vanessa in the show. So when I first saw it, like, I know this girl, I, I know her face. Mm -hmm. Then I realized growing up, I love Keenan and Kayla, like, one of my favorite shows growing yeah, up. Yeah, and man. then also like, look at, like, I'm like, I, like, I know this girl's face. And it clicked, sure. I was like, oh, that's why I know her. So yeah. I'm so happy to see her get her things as well. Along. Absolutely. And then you can see, you know, Terrence has been booking and working a lot. Uh, Jay August was a writer on the show. He's on NBC Council of Dads. Um, you know, Will Catlett, who was in Giants, is on Black Lightning, and he has- He's on um, his, Love Is. Yeah, Love Is, and like KJ Smith is on Sisters on BET. Um, Terrence is on Bigger, and so like the Giants cast, they're out it's in They're doing <laughs> things. Kelsey Scott, who played Sadia, who was uh, the kind of self-help guru, she's on Insecure, you know, so- uh, Oh, I saw, I, look, I, I, I was seeing a lot of familiar faces, and I was like, come on, I, I love yeah. to see, like, just that community of people, like you said, like, when you're working with people and putting people on and really giving people that opportunity, especially for Black artists, where there yeah. are always so few opportunities to see the collaboration among them. I, I love to see that. Absolutely. Like, even Carl, Gil uh, Carl Gilliard, who played the therapist, uh, he just recently put out the first season of his own digital series. And so, um, you know, the Giants... Uh, team is you know still out creating content but uh i'm always working man i'm directing i've been directing a lot of music videos for tmar she's a uh brilliant brilliant artist uh, she's actually the first artist under Issa ray's um record label radio i'm writing on a television show right now so i'm in the writer's room uh so stay staying busy creatively so you basically you're not sleeping man and I'm definitely sleeping. I'm getting my sleep because I'm also in therapy right now too. So I am doing what I need to do to take care of James. You know, particularly in this pandemic, um, everything that's going on uh, right now in this country as it pertains, you know, to Black Lives. Um, I am taking the time to uh, make sure that I am well, so I can, you know, so I can create. That's dope. All right, so I have a lightning round of questions before we go. These are my favorite questions. Sure. So like I kind of told you before, my whole show is about just showing like black joy, like showing like these creative people, these thought leaders, these influential people within the, our community, and kind of just showing that black people are more than our trauma. We're, we're expensive, we're not a monolith. We have full lives, we have full character arcs. We aren't just the funny black friend on television. Um, so these questions are kind of geared towards that. So my first one, what do you love most about black people? Man, our, our, I fucking love our, uh, I love our humor and our creativity. Like every, every day I get on, on, on Twitter and I'm just like, <laughs> I love black people. We are so creative. Like we are so funny. Um, so I'll start there. Our, our creativity, our humor, our style, our swag, um, our beauty. You know. All right. So it's summertime right now. Okay. So what are you in charge of when it comes to bringing things to the cookout? Oh, I'm bringing a potato salad. Okay. Yeah. I don't like. Honestly, I mean, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I don't even like potato salad. I feel like it's not that good. I don't know why. Maybe I haven't had good potato salad, but I, I've never liked it. Probably, but I mean, I guess I could see that potato salad can be an acquired taste, but um. Yeah, I I I I I watched my dad and my mom make potato salad growing up and so actually That was my next question. Is it is it homemade potato salad? You know, some of y'all like to go to the store real quick oh, and nah. switch bowls. No, bro, come on. No, it's homemade. Uh I actually had a little cookout with some friends on Memorial Day and I brought the potato salad. So Okay, okay. 
Yeah. Um, so who is a black person you want to shine a light on today? Mm. Well, I already talked about Tmar, who's a, a Haitian American artist. She has a new EP out called Before I Spill My Tea. I've been doing a lot of the visuals, you know, uh, for uh, this incredible body, body of work. It has, she has a uh, Sir and um, also um, uh, D Smoke, you know, on, on that. So, uh, yeah, let's let it be Tmar. We have a, another music video that's about to drop, I think, next week. So I think she's a great black artist, the spotlight, incredibly talented, and she has a workout that people can go check out right now. Love it. Um, what is your favorite black movie or television show? Ah, that's tough. Okay, so my all-time favorite black movie, don't judge me for this. Uh, I'm nervous now. It's The Color Purple. Okay. I just love The Color Purple. It's one of those films that I can quote from top to bottom. Um, I think it's masterfully done from the direction to the score. But in addition, I've always been a huge Spike Lee fan. Like, like Spike's first five films, to me, from, uh, well, let's go, well, you know, she's got to have it, but really, Do the Right Thing is when I really fell in love with Spike. To School Days, um, to, of course, you know, Malcolm X, you know, Kirkland. Uh, so Spike, in terms of like a black filmmaker, was always a really huge uh, influence on me. But beyond that, uh, Coogler, you know, Ryan Coogler, uh, and not even Black Panther, even though Black Panther was an awesome film. For me, it was Fruitvale Station. Um, so... You know, those are a few. In terms of TV shows, black TV shows, Atlanta. Like, I just rewatched the Juneteenth episode of Atlanta last night. And I was like, man, this show is so good, bro. It's just brilliant. It's just great. Like, uh, I aspire, man. I can only aspire. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, who is your, okay, what is your favorite lyric or song by a black artist? Lyrical song by a black artist. Uh, uh, okay, uh, first thing that comes to my mind is Maxwell Pretty Wings. If I can't have you, then let love have you. If I can't have you, let love have you. Suit flap, you know, <laughs> wings, love, <laughs> something like that. I don't know, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Okay, we, well, first, Maxwell is an icon. Like, oh, uh, also, okay, also Biggie, it was all a dream. Uh, cause I really relate to that. It was all a dream, and then everything that that song, you know, goes through in terms of uh, sipping champagne, you know, um, and the things he was able to do for his mama and his baby girl while <laughs> while people was calling the police on him, you know. Uh, <laughs> and then I think uh, I got like two pot lines for days, but you asked for one, so we'll just stop there. All right, all right. Um, what is your hope for black people? You know, my hope for black people is for us to get to the place where we can recreate what we once had in Tulsa, that we can build up our communities where we can be sustainable and the black dollar can stay and circulate within our communities, uh, where we can create, uh, uh, police systems that work for us within our communities where we can have representatives that have our best interests at mind um, and uh, for us to have generational wealth like that is important you know that's the 400 year setback that we don't have is uh, the wealth and the capital to uh, own um, and ultimately it's about ownership and so I think largely my my biggest dream for black people in this country is to get to a place of ownership where we don't have to um, we don't have to uh, allow the systems that oppress us uh, to continue to oppress us because we got our own. Definitely. And last but not least, what brings you black joy? Brings me black joy, black Twitter. <laughs> black Twitter, man. If we could get a, a check for black Twitter, I'm telling you, people will be it is. It's a joy, bro. It is a. It's pure joy. Well, thank you, James, for joining me today. Where can people follow you? Like, stay up to date on everything you're doing, the Giants um, series, and everything beyond that. For sure. Yeah, you can follow me at Jr. Bland on Twitter, Instagram, and you can check me out at James-Bland.com. I post all of my content, work, updates, press, all of that to the website. 
Love it. Thank you for joining me. I hope you continue to change the landscape of not just the digital world, but obviously with television and film beyond that. And continue just like really be a dope voice for black creatives and you know, well, shake the game up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time, you know, to talk with me. 